Welcome back. JSE-listed micro-lenders have, of course, been in the spotlight recently. That's after African Bank tumbled more than 17% in two trading days. So we're looking at the investment case for the various micro-lenders that, of course, including Abel, uh, Blue Financials, the Transaction Capital, as well as Capitech. So on the desk, uh, familiar faces to CNBC Africa, Viv Govinda from Venani Private Clients and Byron Lotter from Vestac. Jessica Mark, still with me. Um, Byron, you follow Abel closely. You have for some time now. We were talking about it yesterday. As uh, so the management is trying to allay the fears in the market post that first half uh, trading update, HEPs down 25 to 28 percent. Um, so, bottom line, uh, what did what did management say? What's the main reason why we've seen Abel's earnings disappoint and certainly shock the market? Yeah, it's been a, a really tough one to be holding uh, for the last couple of years. Um, you know, we've been calling this one as a, a great buy in terms of a, a good yield, a, a low PE. But of course, uh, as so often is, the market um, is normally right. And there was a good reason that the share price was pulling back. Um, basically, what uh, the African bank uh, management said was um, they have been extremely aggressive in terms of uh, uh, the non-performing loans and writing those off. Mm -hmm. um, over the last uh, few years, the, the micro-lending environment has grown extremely fast and African Bank being first movers and also the only bank that aren't diversified in any of the other banking divisions um, have really been pushing that market. Um, and I think what's happened is they've probably overextended themselves a bit too much. Um, I'm not saying I think what's happened, that was what happened. Um, but there were a lot of other factors that came in. You know, you, you had the big four banks coming into this market. Um, since Basel III came out, uh, the collateralized lending became a lot more difficult for them. So they flew into the unsecured market um, and really pushed up the competition. Um, so we've seen a lot of moving parts and yeah, the African bank uh, management, as I said, overextended themselves and had to write off a whole lot of non-performing loans. Before we look at it from a kind of an industry-wide perspective right now, Viv, just tell us your views on the African bank. Um, the fact, of course, that they have become a lot more conservative when it comes to uh, lending out loans. They've become a lot more aggressive when it comes to provisioning, write-downs. You know, they're trying to clean up that book. Uh, are you confident? I mean, where, do you, where, do, where does the investment stand with you? Look, I, I do think, I'm not, I don't expect a total collapse of the stock, etc. I think unless the economy actually, absolutely falls apart, I think they, their business will carry on. So I don't have a, like a very negative outlook on it. But that being said, I, I do think most analysts would believe that there's been an unsustainable rise in unsecured lending. The total debt burden for the country has stayed the same. But what it has happened, as Baron mentioned, people moved away from collateralized lending because of regulation changes towards it's called, uh, it's unsecured lending because the, basically the, it was a little easier. There were uh, also higher fees to be earned, etc. And that created a bit of a bubble in the, in the region uh, area. And we've seen this for quite some time, and most analysts have seen that. But of course, with any bubble here, you don't want to get out of it since you spot it, because usually with a bubble, it goes on for quite some time, and there's a lot of money to be made in it. Is there a bubble, though? A small That's bubble. That's what I want to ask, because yes. uh, your growth rates, yes, are 40% year in year, but uh, the size of the total credit, unsecured uh, credit, is still very small. Well, actually, there is, they're not that small, but they, there's been a switch away from secured credit to what's unsecured credit, and that was something that we had to be seen for some time here, yeah, again, due to regulatory changes. And the size is not that small. It, it is significant, especially considering you know, the impact it's had on the rest of the economy. Mm -hmm. A normal called, uh, loans, for instance, if you have a house, you borrow money in your house, there's just a secondary effect, a wealth effect that comes through uh, through that kind of you know loan. You know, if your house gets more valuable, you get a wealth effect coming through. With unsecured lending, there's more of a direct effect. You know, when people go out and borrow money directly, they usually go and buy something <coughs> You know, quite soon with it. So it's, it's had quite an impact on the market. So one could possibly say that some of the retailers have been benefiting from it as well because they've gotten this money coming in where we don't have the wage or the real wage mm. growth to justify some of the increases we've been seeing. How do you assess the risk of, the, of this bubble and um, whatever it is that has formed in <laughs> South Africa? I don't think it's a bubble at all. You know, if you have a look back at the dynamics and the history of South Africa, you'll see that um, you know before the the, the country liberalised, um, the majority of the population didn't have any access to credit. Um, at the same time, we had quite strict legislation with regards to unsecured lending. Then the National Credit uh, Act came in and, and changed all that, and they took the the unsecured lending away from the loan sharks and more to the the regulated banks. Um, and those two factors. Uh, um, which were unnatural, um, allowed for a natural progression to uh, a, a more sustainable equilibrium in, in the mix of credit that South Africa had. So the big growth that we've seen here, I think, is just a 
move to, the, to what should naturally be unsecured. Um, we also have a situation in South Africa, Mark Lamberti uh, mentioned in Transaction Capital's results the other day, that 90, 96% of South Africans don't have a home loan. Uh, you know, we have a, a certain situation here where a lot of people in the rural areas um, uh, don't actually own their homes. Um, you know, there's a whole system where the chiefs own the land and, uh, you know, allocate houses and banks will never give a loan um, uh, out, a, a home loan based on, on those kind of, of housing. So those people have to go to unsecured lending. So I think it was just a natural move to, to an equilibrium. I don't think it was a bubble at all. Mm -hmm. okay, um, so Viv, I'd like to just bring in, sorry Mark, mm -hmm. the issue of garnishy orders. It's been a quite a hot button topic. If there is regulation around those garnishy orders, who will it impact the most? Who has the most exposure to that L Look, problem? I mean, th the thing with garnishy orders, as you, as you saw for Marikana, for instance, it, it, it's a quite a big issue. And some of the things that hap that's happening there is that you have individuals that are borrowing money, they have these garnishy orders placed against them, they don't quite understand the loans that they've taken. And they may not understand exactly what their rights are in certain cases. And you could find even companies that are issuing these garnishy orders, employers are forced effectively to go out and you know, implement them because if not, they are liable, not the employee directly. And so it's become an issue here, I think, that, that the government has to have to look at. Uh, it's really become important ever since Marikana and that issue has come up here. If we do see something like that happen, I don't think some of the major lenders are going to be affected. Some of the smaller competitors are probably going to be affected, especially when it comes to the abuses. I mean, the abuses are quite large in the mm -hmm. area just because of the customer base not being educated enough about their rights with regards to what uh, they can or cannot be done to them. Sure, and, and I think one of the issues also comes around the, the, the actual ownership of a bank account. I mean, we have mm -hmm. a very poorly banked society in South Africa in terms of number of accounts. You know, and it's very interesting, we were having quite a big debate around Capitec earlier this week saying that they were now the fourth largest retail bank in South Africa, and there's quite a lot of debate as to whether they are or aren't. But what is interesting is when people c start comparing Capitec versus ABLE, one of the things with ABLE is that ABLE didn't really take much in the way of deposits. I know they've started moving that way as well. But you know, the, one of the comments that came up from the US hedge fund managers at one of the investment conferences this week is that ABLE is effectively in the same category as the Lehman's. Now, I don't buy that argument. I mean, I, for me, I feel this is a hedge fund manager who's got, a, got an opportunity to sit in the press and simply talk down a stock that they're obviously shorting in it. I mean, what is the, uh, so I guess the question then is, what is the impact, you know, ABLE has a very big foreign shareholding impact, and nearly 50% of understand. So, you know, is the share price movement having a lot to do with what those foreign shareholders are doing in terms of, mm -hmm. of, of going long and short and trade? You know, is it more of a short, the volatility is more short term at the moment? Yeah, ABLE are in an unfortunate position where they are the only bank that is undiversified. Mm -hmm. They are completely exposed to the unsecured market. So if you're a hedge fund manager and you see, or you, you see, you know, the, the unsecured credit market growing fivefold um, in a matter of, or threefold in a matter of five years, mm -hmm. and you think there's a bubble, then you're going to go find out where you can short that market. Mm -hmm. And ABLE was the first entry because everyone else was a bit diversified. For the big four banks, the unsecured um, section was not nearly big enough to actually have a big impact on earnings. Um, Capitec were the other ones, but I think they get about 12% of their earnings from transaction mm -hmm. costs. So they got the retail side. So African Bank were the first entry into shorting that market. So I think, um, yes, of course these guys are talking their own book and if he expects a big bubble to burst and uh, African Bank are fully exposed to that, then of course they will collapse. Mm -hmm. So that's why you have to look at the macro picture and see whether you think there is going to be a, a big bubble burst. And of course I just explained what, uh, how I feel about that earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, this is, uh, you see these kind of things, especially happening in the US markets with big hedge fund managers, with big egos, having big fights mm -hmm. and trying to talk their own book um, in terms of shorts that they have in the market. Does, does Able now need to move to become more like a Capitec? Um, because, you know, when you speak to Leon Kirkinus, he's got a great social conscience and he sees the value that Able adds to society. He talks about the fact that they committed to the unsecured lending space, they help their clients out in times of need uh, to refinance debt. Mm. But ultimately, do you think that from an investment perspective, it would be better to diversify now and be more aggressive about that? It's always better to be more diversified as any, as any company because if you're exposed to a single area, no matter what it is, it could be Microsoft with you know, it was Windows. If that one thing fails, then your entire business is under pressure. If you have more than one, basically, you know, that's called 
area or where you get your revenue from, you can afford to have a downturn in one area and you can have the others will pick it up. So it's always better for a business to be more diversified. But we must not forget, as, as you mentioned, you know, there is a social need to have these, these organizations out there. Look at the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, for instance. The fact that the, un the poor, one of the reasons that the poor are poor is the fact they don't have access to reasonable levels or reasonably uh, cost-effective uh, loans, basically. They have a lot of needs that they are more than willing to call this borrow money for, and these are the things that are probably going to be useful for them going forward, but they don't have access to it, so they are forced to go to loan shocks and therefore pay these exorbitant fees. So there is a purpose to these businesses. Let mm -hmm. us not just say they are, they are, they are, they are evil and they are w whatnot, mm -hmm. but the question that arises is, has what's been happening in the market right now the best way for things to go forward? And I don't think that it is. Some of the things we have seen, for instance, Marikana, like I mentioned before, the problem with these, some of these miners, et cetera, is that they have a problem where they've borrowed money and they don't have as much of their paychecks coming to them as you think they would. Mm -hmm. In fact, they get a small fraction of what they should be getting. And that means that they are constantly under pressure. And should they lose their jobs, et cetera, et cetera, we have a great deal of negative uh, consequences following. So what happens now? I mean, it, it, talking to about Leon, Leon Cook, and it's, it's a management credibility issue now. I think that a lot you read a lot of the analyst reports. They said, if you'd warned <laughs> us, we'd have been able to adjust accordingly. What do they do from a management perspective to prevent a similar kind of shock the next time that they, you know, not necessarily they run into trouble, but just around guidance around going forward? Well, I think obviously they've got to try and improve their communication. Um, I know a, a, a few months ago they were mentioning that everything was fine, their, their loans were still increasing nicely, and then all of a sudden this updates, and you know, that's why the share price dropped 17% mm -hmm. on, uh, on the day. Um, but I think also the management were, were hit by um, you know, a bit of a shock, and so was the whole country when we had these big strikes uh, last year. The RAND weakened uh, drastically, mm -hmm. um, and we've seen it throughout uh, a lot of um, uh, retail earnings, uh, ShopRite, CashBill, but the, the lower income groups are really struggling and management had uh, African bank management are also fully geared towards the lower income groups mm -hmm. and they had no idea that this was going to happen you know when the RAND weakens and imports increase and, and everything becomes more expensive it may, has a bigger impact on a smaller salary than what it does on a bigger salary mm -hmm. um, so that has had a massive effect on, on, on that kind of environment so they had no, no idea that that was going to happen. Don't you think it would perhaps also help if these guys handled their reputational capital a bit more wisely they communicated better as you you said and they handle the bad press around micro lending a little more delicately and put a positive slant to it. I always feel, <laughs> if I could just jump in here, yeah. just from the media's perspective, I always feel that Abel is trying to do that. Yeah. Always. You uh, know, so <laughs> I don't know what more they can do. Look, like I said, they, they, have, a, they have a definite social function. Mm. A poor person wants to have access to credit. Credit is one of the great things that makes the modern economy work. If a wealthy person needs credit, a poor person probably needs it more. Uh, that being said, uh, it, this, there needs to be education among the clientele, for instance. I mean, you can't have people like this situation, some of, uh, for instance, we mentioned the miners, I keep on coming back to that mm -hmm. issue again. But there are people out there that don't have the education when it comes to borrowing money, who are borrowing money f at rates that they can't afford to pay back. And this becomes an issue because they usually end up borrowing money to pay back loans or to even pay for consumables, things that they're consuming in the month. You should never do that unless you're in very dire circumstances. But this is the kind of thing that they should be doing. If they want to get a better reputation, they should pay more attention to their customers and make sure that their customers don't get into the kind of straits or the negative you know, situation that we see many of them getting into at the moment. So yeah. perhaps investing in educational programs for clients, for yes, example. Yes, most certainly. Yeah. Let's talk about where to invest then. Um, you know, do you go for an African bank, stay committed to it? Do you look at a Capitech, Blue Financial Services, obviously one of the companies in the list, uh, Transaction Capital, or do you go for a solid big bank with diversification? Uh, and African presence and all that? Well, there certainly are lots of opportunities in that market at the moment. Um, a lot of the companies are trading on very low PEs. Um, these are historic, of course, you know, going forward, who knows what the earnings are going to do. Um, we're still holding African Bank. They are the biggest player in the market. Um, uh, you, they've got the market share. Um, and, you know, Leon Kirkinis, as you mentioned, has been very forthcoming. And, uh, you know, I've been to a couple of African Bank presentations, and he's a very likable guy. And he, he does emphasize, um, you know, education. And I guess that's what the National Credit Act did. They put it in the hands of the bank but they said, listen, you've got to um, tell your clients exactly what's happening and you've got to educate and you've got to let them know what's, what's happening. Um, so I still think there are a, a lot of opportunities there. We're going to stick with African Bank. They've got a solid management team with a good track record um, and uh, you know, often it's best to stick with the biggest players in these kind of uh, situations because it's the smaller ones that fall out.
Mm. Where do you stand on that? Look, I'm a bit more nervous about the sector as a whole. I mean, we saw the last jobs number come out, and we had 100,000 less jobs in the country than we'd had you know, in the previous period. So that's something to be watching out for. We are going into a season in which we are looking at some of these miners, especially, mm. and back to them, we know, of course, Amplats, 14,000 jobs possibly. Many of the other large miners out there, many of the large industries out there, are looking to cut workers. And that's going to be negative for the sector. I mean, possibly bad loans going higher. At the same time, look at our larger banks, the exposure to Africa. Africa is growing at 6% a year. South Africa is growing at less than 3 mm -hmm. You want to have that exposure to the growing markets out there. Uh, it's a longer term issue, of course. You're not going to get the payback this year. But over a longer period of time, I think the guys that expose themselves to Africa as opposed to just South Africa are going to have a bigger payout come through. So which of which of the banks? Uh, I mean, obviously Standard mm. Bank is the biggest one. Yes. But do, do you have a preference in the sector right now? Look, I, th I think it's called FNB's model is quite good. I like FNB as well in the sector. I think the kind of the, the way they are going. What Abel did was Abel went for the Aerodine stores and had all the little branches effectively in different areas, the physical branches. What uh, FNB is doing is giving people cell phones, and that's going to be your branch effectively. And that's something that you should be looking forward to using technology to get access to people that you don't have to put the infrastructure down on the ground to get access to. Mm -hmm. It's, it's worth also talking about transaction capital because they have a very different model. I mean, what's your take on that, Jess? I like transaction capital because they're highly diversified and they serve various sectors within the SME uh, market as well. I also like Mark Lamberti's approach. He sort of um, reduces the risk in one area by having a, a business in another area where it's sort of counter-cyclical. So if you see the micro lending falling, the asset-backed uh, vehicle, the financing sector picks, picks it up. So mm -hmm. I like the way it's balanced out and I think they've got a great management team as well mm -hmm. going forward. Yeah, I mean, uh, like I, I have to say, I mean, if you think about the African bank story, just uh, like I'll, I'll come to that because I want to tie it into the transaction. African bank, for all its faults, still delivered, what, 28% of loss, just in dividends. We're not talking about it, it was a very good dividend payer mm -hmm. over the last decade. It has been, and, and that has been underpinned to its return. The share price hasn't done a hell of a lot in five years, but the dividend has underpinned it. The transaction capital is an interesting story. I think you're going to have to, it, the question of scale is going to become an important one because every time that an, an entrepreneur in the finance sector creates something, what happens? Four big banks come and throw the kitchen sink at it and try and take the sector. Mm -hmm. I think that is going to be a big challenge for them. Um, interesting model. I, I, I have to say I would lean more toward African Bank over transaction capital yeah. right now.